Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. This is the podcast for the first Sunday of Advent. So happy lectionary new year to Yay. all of our listeners. This happy is a new very year. exciting day. Happy new year. I hope that you have all your decorations up for happy new year and your plates and napkins. And I see that Matt has a lovely little Charlie Brown Christmas tree in the back. I have a wreath. And uh, yeah, here we are, new lectionary year, year of Luke. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But first, let's get the text in front of us for this first Sunday of Advent. We have Jeremiah 33, 14 through 16, Psalm 25, 1 through 10, 1 Thessalonians 3, 9 through 13, and Luke 21, 25 through 36. So we might be familiar with this Advent pattern. We talked a little bit about that before the uh, before the podcast started. That we here we're going to start with an apocalyptic kind of image, and then we move into two Sundays of John the Baptist, and then the Magnificat. So that's the overview of the gospel readings, anyway. And, uh, and we're also, just to let our listeners know that with this new lectionary year, we're going to be trying some different formats for the podcast. So don't worry, the podcast is still here. But one of the things we're going to do is recognizing that we're often a little light on the psalm, and we often say the same thing. Uh, we're going to spend most of our time on the gospel reading, the first reading, and the second reading in our conversations, and also trust that if you are inclined toward the psalm, there are all kinds of resources on our site for that possibility. Did I cover everything, fellow podcasters? I think you walked us through. If, if we ever don't, Comment on a psalm, Caroline, would you say it's still a good idea to use it liturgically? Yes. <laughs> That's the line, right? We we'll just yeah. put that on loop. Always. <laughs> Always a good idea to use it liturgically. So if you're ever wondering what to do with the psalm, that's what to do in some way, shape, or form. But in the meantime, we begin Advent, year A, and a whole new gospel, the gospel of Luke. And so that's, I think, a first thing that you ask is how does Luke set up our themes or our way of thinking about Advent? What are the particularities of Luke's gospel that shape our Advent preaching? I think that's always an important, uh, an important step or important first question when we make that when we make that shift to a new gospel year. And I, I appreciated uh, the uh, commentary and um, it caused me to ask a question um, be simply because I like the language that was used. Uh, uh, so beginning this with this idea of how will we respond to the seasonal icons in the midst of what to many feels like cosmic cat catastrophe and ap apocalyptic urgency. Or at the least, it looks like things aren't moving toward a season of peace and gladness. That may be a, a, an idea to have in mind, um, even if things in your area or in your community seem to be going well, um, be attentive to folks for whom uh, the fear that is lifted up as this entry into Advent uh, with this particular text from Luke, might uh, really need uh, a reality of the prayer that, God, we know your promises, but we need a glimpse of your peace right now to keep believing. That might be an idea or a question to keep before you as you're preparing uh, for this first season, first Sunday in this new season. Of Advent. Yeah, that's good. I, I think I, I think as well. I would go with the way that in Luke's gospel, uh, Jesus is always saving, and he's 
he's saving wherever he is. And to remind people, this is this is a gospel that's going to uh, show us Jesus as a child, as as an infant, even before he's born, he's going to be proclaimed as salvific, as an as an act of God when he's a child. Uh, Simeon's going to say, "My eyes have seen your salvation." You know, as he as he holds the the infant Jesus, Jesus will declare, "Salvation has come to this house." To Zacchaeus, he'll declare salvation to somebody as he dies. In other words, that wherever he is, salvation is present. In the book of Acts, we'll talk about the risen Christ being not somewhere else, but now still saving through the work of, of his followers and the, and the work of the Spirit. And so even here in Luke 21, where it looks like there is no hope in that first paragraph, at least, and again, this is the end of a longer discourse. Right there still is this deep confidence, right? Stand up and raise your heads. Your redemption is drawing near. You, you don't need Jesus to necessarily do something in Luke. You just need Jesus to be there. And so it raises questions about how the incarnation itself is salvific or is a sign of God's saving presence. We're going to see this next week when John will talk about um all eyes will see the salvation of God. I don't know if I'm translating that, remembering that right in my head, but it's close to that. Um, the time of salvation at Pentecost, the beginning of Acts, right? This is everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved is the end of the Joel quote in Acts chapter two. So to help people see that even in this moment, even this really scary scene, there is still this confidence that the sheer presence of Jesus is all you're going to need. And so that's, I think, behind the, the parable as well, and even these these warnings about staying on your guard. Don't lose sight of where Jesus is. And that takes attentiveness. Mm -hmm. and, so, oh. uh, and so recognizing, I mean, that's one of the things that I, that what I hear in this passage of, you know, that standing up and raising your heads, uh, being alert, uh, even the verses 29 through 33, where where there is an invitation, I think, by Jesus to a kind of communal interpretation of what we're seeing. But it, it, it requires an attentiveness, which mirrors in many ways the portrait of Jesus in Luke, where you have a, 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 a Jesus, right, who sees, who is attentive, to where salvation can happen and where that salvation can happen is often in the least likely of places and with the least likely of people uh, and comes from those, from those sources. And so if we're looking for, for looking for Advent themes, then how is it that that can be a, a one that we call people's attention ha -ha, to is that uh, attentiveness of God's presence. And if, that, if that's really all that is, all, all that, it, that this gospel is pointing to, not all, but you know what I mean? Yeah, I would point people ahead even to like, you know, on Christmas, we're gonna, we're gonna read from Luke 2 and the angels are gonna go to the shepherds and what are they gonna say? Peace on earth, right? This is gonna be the message of the coming of the Messiah. But we're gonna walk through a passage here that talks about just how hard life is mm -hmm. and what happens when things fall apart. Mm -hmm. We're going to have two weeks of John where John's going to say some scary stuff. Even the Magnificat's a little scary if, in if Advent 4 because we're talking about nations being thrown down, the powerful being thrown down. I mean, uh, the, the image of that is, is folks like us suddenly realizing, <laughs> oh, you know, maybe we're not the, the be all and end all. Yeah. So in what looks like a lot of disruptive, a lot of scary, even maybe threatening circumstances, this is the journey toward the welcoming of the Messiah as a sign of peace and a sign of setting the world right. So how are we going to get there? I mean, that's kind of the Advent road this year, I think. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't want people to lose track of where it's headed because there's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of rattling of the cages between now and then from Luke. I think that's a significant is we know where it's headed, but to be attentive to the moment that we currently are in uh, along the journey, um, because for those who are um, 
questioning, for those who are hurting, um, the promise as if it has arrived becomes shallow unless it really feels like you genuinely get my fear or genuinely understand my confusion. And um, these readings actually affirm that um, um, liminality of where we are in the journey. I probably haven't quoted this since last Advent, but there's <laughs> there's a Dietrich Bonhoeffer sermon that I love, which is actually, a, it's a, from a text in Revelation, but he talks about how modern modern Christians have become so kind of pacified by all of the Christmas imagery of a baby in a manger that we've forgotten that the idea of the coming of God into our world should be terrifying news to anybody who has a conscience. And so before we get, you know, into the, the meek and mild Jesus in the manger, we have to remember that the thought of God intervening in human experience should bring a bit of terror. Mark's gospel is really good at that. We tend to think that Luke's the friendly gospel, but here's a lot of places that are reminders. God's going to shake things up mm -hmm. because God loves the world so much that God won't leave it to itself. Well, and especially a world, when you think about Luke, a world that is, uh, that, who, that the powers are determined, I was going to say hell-bent. <laughs> uh, that's my gym, but... Uh, hell bent on keeping people captive and mm -hmm. keeping people mm -hmm. oppressed. Mm -hmm. And you have then, of course, in verse 28, because your redemption is drawing near your deliverance. And that's another, I think, really powerful Advent sermon here is in that word redemption of, of, of deliverance, of um, release uh, to liberate. And so, what does that look like, particularly in a world where, uh, and it would be, it would be a challenge to a world that benefits from <laughs> uh, keeping people in their place or oppression or captivity. And uh, so to come to, ha to have redemption be that near means that, uh, means that those kinds of powers don't get to do that anymore. And uh, so that's, that's not going to work in their favor, so to speak. <laughs> the uh, people people who are new to the podcast should know I, I love Advent and really, <laughs> really have fun with it. I think it's better than Christmas. Uh, the, the challenge, I think, to good Advent preaching and worship is to recognize the kind of collapsing of time that happens in mm -hmm. Advent. Like it's um, the way in which Advent tries to hold together, I forgot where this comes from. It's, it's a Roman Catholic teacher who I think first proposed this, but that Advent is the time to celebrate Christ's coming in majesty, history, and mystery. In other words, mm -hmm. it's the return here of the, of the majestic return of Christ at the end, you know, to consummate all things. History going back to the first century, then, and then mystery being how is Christ still being born today, right? How is this not how is this not a, a sentimental story about 2000 years ago and a, 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 a vulnerable couple finding a place to have their baby? How is it more than a story about a future hope that can get kind of pie in the sky, a little bit scary, and we don't always kind of know what to do with that? But how is it also a story that says, what does it mean to welcome God into our midst? And what does it mean to, to do that with the confidence that it's happened before and it will happen again and it still is taking place? And so there are no good biblical texts that do that collapsing for us. And so Advent kind of does it with these, with these blunt instruments, right. And ask the preacher to, to bring in the finesse, right. And to say, how do you take these really loud voices that you're going to get for at least the next three weeks, Mary's prayer might be rather loud as well in week mm -hmm. four and find a way to, to make it yield that attentiveness that you talked about, for example, Caroline, and that confidence. Uh, that I think you talked about joy too. All right, stuff about Advent for me. I'll just, I'll. I love it. I'll be I don't know. We've got three more Sundays, so. That's right. We you do. Can, hang on. You just done a commercial. For this is the best one, especially when it falls a couple of days after American Thanksgiving, like it does, because people like on a holiday weekend, and all of a sudden, someone gets up to read scripture and they're like, whoa, wait a minute. Where did this come from? 
<laughs> thought we were going to talk about being thankful. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about why we are really in need of being thankful. Mm-hmm. Not, yeah, and you don't have to read far to find. Potential. Yeah, that's okay. yeah. That well, chaos was, is all around. When you were talking about the collapsing of time, Matt, I was actually thinking of of how one how we really experience that in the Jeremiah reading. I mean, it's a it's a nice part of Jeremiah. <laughs> <with> the, <laughs> one of those verses. <laughs> a hopeful, yeah, a handful of how hopeful verses as the commentary points out, but you do get a kind of collapsing of time that's narrated in those three verses that uh, that I think speaks to that of the day surely coming, but you have a, you know, fulfilling a promise way back when, uh, and, and, and then an also looking forward a branch, uh, to sh- spring up from David. Uh, and so, you know, that Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. Jerusalem will live in safety. Uh, and so you, yeah, you do have that sense of the, mm, the way in which God's working in the world does an, invite a kind of, um, a kind of cosmic reflection of, of past and present and future or past, future and present, or, uh, you can't, it's, it's difficult to speak about God's activity localized into one, one space. You're always, or one location. You're always looking back at what God has done and, and know about the promises of what God will do. And so that's, uh, I think that's really captured well in that Jeremiah reading. That anticipation of what God is doing because we know what God has done um, is that collapsing of time that you talked about, Matt. And uh, Caroline, when you were when you were doing when you were kind of um, uh, collapsing the the uh, three verses, um, you didn't say what I want to lift up, and that is that um, what this righteous one does is to execute justice and righteousness across the land or in the land. And I, I want to lift that up because in anticipation or in remembering, it's important for us to recognize that the moment we're living in needs to be that spreading of justice and righteousness for everyone, not just for me and my tribe. And that ultimately is the promise that the house of Israel and the house of Judah are to be. You know, it it never, even as the children of God are separated uh, because of their division, the Northern and Southern kingdom, um, ultimately it is not one against the other in God's ideal. It is bringing them back together for the sake of all the world. And so peace on my side of town and war on yours is not the righteous justice of God. And for that, we anticipate what God is doing. And Jeremiah captures that. We know Jeremiah is this weeping prophet. Jeremiah spends a whole lot of time talking about what isn't while never losing focus that the days are surely coming because God has said that they are. Oh, one other thing, um, because I look back down at my note, uh, and that is, uh, and I thought about this also, Matt, when you talked about the collapsing of time. Um, We move forward at this point because we've just entered the season of Advent. But let's also remember last Sunday was Christ the King Sunday. This is where we're talking about what is the reign of God look like. In that last portion of this verse, the Lord is our righteousness, is a reminder that it is the reign of God that brings peace, not our personal or tribal prosperity. I would just add to Jeremiah as well, the way in which, well, let me back up. Julia O'Brien's commentary I found really helpful. Um saying, don't run too quickly to this being just about hope. How is this also a, a way of calling you back? Um, I'm not one who usually holds too much stock in, in liturgical traditions, but 
uh, you know, Advent was originally a fast, like Lent was a fast. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is this time of preparation beyond, you know, trimming the tree and all that stuff. But, um, and John will make that clear next week mm -hmm. as well. And so how, again, how does the coming of God into our midst um, require us to take honest looks at who we are and where we fall short in that kind of justice or where we're satisfied? Well, if it's justice for my neighborhood, that's all I really need to care about. The other neighborhoods can figure it out for themselves, but that's not the kind of justice envisioned here. And so this this is a season then of expectation. Yes, and deep longing and sometimes frustration <laughs> and groaning. So when when you when you're having difficulty getting that uh tree or finding that tree or fitting that tree in, it should take you beyond the frustration of the moment and remind you that we are living in the liminality of waiting on God's reign. That's right. And there's nothing wrong with a crooked Christmas tree. Or a wimpy Charlie Brown one. Well, you all can say that, but that <laughs> doesn't work in my house. <laughs> I have very particular ideas of how it's all going to look and how the tree is going to be. And yeah, so you all can have the imperfectness, but I'm going to stick with my my perfect trimmed we, house. We all need an example to follow, Caroline. Thank you for being <laughs> ours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, should we turn to First Thessalonians? Yeah, let's do that. I uh, one thing that I, uh, I I really wanted to point to the commentary that is uh, I mean it is about it is about the uh, it is about the text, but just this invitation to think about these themes that are that are with Advent of, of hope, peace, joy, and love. And those are the candles, right? Uh, that how, how organically connected they are and dependent on one another. And I think we might have a tendency to isolate them from one another. And what difference does it make to define love uh, connected to joy, hope, and peace? What difference does it make to define hope Think about hope connected to peace, joy, and love. And so uh, that I, I thought that was a, that in and itself could be like a whole theme for Advent of how do we see all four of these uh, these realities uh, connected to one another? And how do you in love, how do you know peace and hope? How do you know joy? Uh, I was I, it, again, based on uh, based on Thessalonians, of course, based on the text, but in that wider that in that wider introduction to Advent and the kinds of themes that it raises, I was really I was moved by that and thought, oh, I be that would be really fun to <laughs> and inspiring to think about um, how each of those each of those features of Advent are connected with one another. Just to point that out as a possible idea for people. I like that. Uh, I was struck by the last verse uh, of the reading, uh, verse 13. Um, uh, and the thought that I had, I actually wrote it down. Um, and it is, when we find this communal favor, um, the task is to continue blameless before God. So the power and prosperity among the people does not necessarily equate with blamelessness before God. So as we find our position and our prosperity and our power uh, in the community, in the favor of our community, this text challenges us to um, hold ourselves uh, in holiness and come before God blameless. And I think, Caroline, that is a way to keep this intertwining of uh, these four weeks of, of hope, love, joy, uh, and peace. I want to throw gratitude in there as well. Mm -hmm. I think Just, that's how it starts, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, the Bible scholar in me wants to make sure everybody knows this is the second, this is the conclusion of the second Thanksgiving in this letter. Paul is so thankful that he, tw he has two Thanksgivings. He's so thrilled that these relatively new believers are hanging in there despite all of the 
difficulties and hardships that are coming their way, and he just can't stop thanking God enough. So it's a five-chapter letter, and here at the end of chapter three, he's still kind of doing introduction because <laughs> he's just so happy. And then uh, in verses 11, 12, 13, right? These are blessings, right? I want this to, to happen. May God make this happen. And the connection between holiness and love is, is really powerful, really important. I think it's useful to know that the Bible never really defines holiness. It's just a, it's a characteristic of God, but it's not about necessarily a kind of inner ethical perfection as much as it's set apart. And so Paul is urging this church to distinguish itself from everybody else around it through love. And that's an interesting, I wish churches spent more time, I wish I spent more time reasoning about what that would look like, as opposed to all the other ways we think we have to fill out, uh, fulfill a mission or distinguish ourselves. I, I think you've said better what I was trying to get at, that that communal favor, when we look like everybody else, um, we may have missed that separate countercultural presence of the peace of God, or as we're using this week, of the love that God expects us to offer ourselves and our neighbors. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave, and be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.